Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Brooklyn-born jazz trumpeter and composer Jamie Branch. She talks about her newest 2019 CD, Fly or Die 2, Bird Dogs of Paradise Solo, and then this happens to be a follow-up to her first 2017 CD called Fly or Die. She was raised in Red Hook, Brooklyn, and started playing trumpet at the age of nine, and Miles Davis has always been a huge musical influence. From Brooklyn, she went to Chicago, then to New England's Conservatory of Music, back to Chicago, then to Baltimore, and now she is a huge name in the world of jazz. We caught up with her on tour in Spain to discuss her beginnings, her rise in the jazz world, and so much more. So please, dig it. Jamie, hey, thank you very much for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. It's both an honor and a pleasure to speak with you. Oh man, likewise. Before we get into your newest album, Fly or Die... Two, I, I just kind of want to start off here before we get into specific albums, your 2017 and this new 2019. The thing that I find interesting, and I've been on a really good roll here lately, I've talked to Kneebody and Go Go Penguin, and I'm really talking to some people in the world of jazz that are melding these eclectic worlds. They're taking all these sounds and they're kind of doing what, you know, the inventors of bebop were doing. You know, they were kind of getting away from this traditional way of playing and incorporating new things. So before we begin, I kind of want to philosophically ask you, what are you trying to do? Are you just being you? Are you combining your id and all of these artistic feelings you have? What are you doing exactly? Yeah, I mean, I think that's it. I think it's just trying to take the music that's in my head and make it in real time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and, and grabbing that from wherever and wherever I've been or would love to be or have, you know, heard or have dreamt about, you know? Right now you're on a European tour in Spain. You're constantly busy. People are, I mean, th 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 things are buzz. So clearly what you're doing is, is, is music, you know, so to speak, to people's ears. <laughs> yeah, I, I will thank you. <laughs> but also, uh, you know, it's it's like... There's a lot of filters these days, a lot of different types of filters, not just like, not just on the, in our phone, but like really, really stemming from that, that culture. And so this music is, is really like as honest as I can be to the feelings that I have when I'm making the record at the time, you know, they're like snapshots of where I'm at in that, in that time. Uh, I'm not really trying to sound like something specific. But I'm really trying to hear what's happening in my body, you know? You know, there was a book, uh, Nate Shannon's book, I read, and there was a, a section on Steve Coleman. And he was talking about it. it was so ethereal and so cerebral the way he was explaining this. And he said, basically, if he's playing something outside in front of a mountain, he's not playing to nature. He's trying to, like, play a mountain. Like, he wants that song to be a mountain. And... Do you ever see that kind of conceptually where you're like trying to create these things that are just kind of above and beyond, like you said, distraction or anything that we conceive as what music should be classified as? That to me feels like a little bit of a two-part question, right? I'm trying to like set up environments, like create environments in which to play in. That's the way I'm really thinking about things this, these days. For me, it's like pure sound all the way through, but there is a journey there you know there is some sort of construct there i would be lying if i said that this is just it all came to me out just like this the first time you know there is a an editor's hand i guess in there too you know a lot of the times the way i make visual art which i'm like completely unskilled in but i completely love doing or completely untrained in i should say i guess i throw a lot of paint down i throw a lot of materials down at first and then kind of reductionist almost like I, I like find or not even reductionist but just like I find the shapes within these colors so like the color goes down in a form that's not dictated and then the form kind of is drawn out of that and I kind of feel I think a similar way to music in that like I have these like I have structures I do have written stuff but it's not I'm not trying to be didactic with it I'm not trying to have it be the music. The music is really the music that is made when we all play together. 
And, you know, what Steve Coleman said is cool, but, and I think about Sonny Rollins, you know, sitting on the bridge, the Williams, what's now the Williamsburg Bridge. It might have been back then too. I don't know. <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, that story of yeah, like yeah. he used to go yeah, and, and practice and just hear his sound it's in the, in the environment, but really become part of that web of sound you know it's like hearing yourself amidst everything else but also being part of everything else you know it's yeah without getting too hippy dippy <laughs> right no i dig it i totally dig what you're saying um uh-huh. so what's it feel like at these shows or i mean you have to just be completely thrilled to be in spain and playing live what do these shows feel like for you it feels both like a dream come true and also exactly what i'm supposed to be doing that sounds like a Maslovian, self-actualized kind of the the top of the hierarchy. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's go ahead and get into your latest album. You originally Fly or Die was in 2017. This is the follow-up. Talk to me a little bit about this album. There's a few like striking differences. One would be that uh, the cellist is Lester St. Louis instead of Tamika Reed, who was on our first record. Then another is that there's vocals on the record. And I don't know, what's another difference? <laughs> <laughs> on this record, I was really trying to spend time in areas. I was thinking a lot about this idea that there is no stop or start to the music. You know, there's, like the first piece, uh, Birds of Paradise, is an Embira piece. Chad had said something to me on tour that really hit me, which was that, a lot of people listen to like the Mbira music and they think at the end that they just kind of fall apart and that's how they stop. They stop when they fall apart. But that's not the case. They stop when they want to stop and the fall apart is part of the stopping because the music doesn't actually stop. The music continues forever. So it's not about having that tight ending, you know? And so like I think a lot, I've been thinking about that these days, like really spending time in areas and then like moving to a different space or like through to a different space and and setting up these environments but every single song on the record like in my mind you know where we come in is the like the almost arbitrary start and where we end is almost the arbitrary end because like it's it's still going somewhere you know quantum free jazz yeah i dig it i dig it so (laughs) you were born in brooklyn you started playing at the age of nine I was born on Long Island, actually. At, okay. You know, yeah. I, I always find this interesting that I've kind of later in life picked up this <laughs> this craft of getting into jazz because my dad was actually born in Brooklyn in 55 and he moved to Babylon in Massapequa and he grew up there. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's very funny. My mom was born in Manhattan but, was, but grew up in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Wow. Just the hospital was in Manhattan, basically, um, in 1950, and their family moved eventually out to Farmingdale. Wow. Yeah, it's wild. Do you know where that is? Yeah, yeah. I, and I've it's been a little bit there. further, but like they were Colombian immigrants, and they left, I don't know, sometime in the 60s, because my, my, her older sister had really bad asthma and was like going to the hospital weekly, like... Anyway. Yeah, no, no, it's weird. It's like, you know, people are always like, how'd you end up in Kansas City? My dad got in the Air Force, got stationed mm-hmm. here because he wanted to see the world and ended up falling in love, and here I am. So it's just kind of how things work. But Kansas City's a cool place, man. It, you know, I, I actually have never been there. Oh, man, yeah. it's The thing about Kansas City is it, it's one of those places that I always hear from musicians that end up living here or coming through is they're always surprised. Not in a bad way, but just like the, the, the level of arts, visual, performing. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it, we got a lot going on and cost of living and that whole thing. So it's it, it's cool. Right. It's a hip place. The artist, sure. artist cost of living. And are you in the Charlie Parker, Kansas City? Yes. Hey! <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and so you guys have that, that, that super famous all-night jam session, right? We have the Mutual Musicians Foundation on 18 and Vine, and then, of course, the Blue Room and the whole district. Yeah. So it's all... Humming and thrumming. So, when you were growing up, your influences were Don Cherry, uh, Miles Davis. You were so. Talk to me about these influences and how they've kind of like shaped who you are as a musician. It's easier for me to talk maybe about the influences than how they've shaped me. You know, my intro into jazz was definitely Miles Davis, specifically the record Fifty Eight Sessions. 
Um, <laughs> is, it, and, the, and the record is called 58, 58 Sessions featuring Stella by Starlight. And the very first track on the record is Green Dolphin Street. And that was the very first solo I ever transcribed. But um, because the record was called Featuring Stella by Starlight, my little kid brain was like, oh, that means Stella by Starlight's the first track. And so <laughs> for a really long time, I thought Green Dolphin Street was Stella by Starlight. In fact, I like perf- I played it for one of my mom's friends who was a jazz piano player. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, uh, I learned Stella by Starlight and I played Green Dolphin Street. He goes, uh, that's actually Green Dolphin Street. And I said, no, no, I'm pretty sure it's Stella by Starlight. <laughs> Um, I had that kind of, you know, attitude. So, like, Miles, you know, for me, like, the playing was more accessible than, you know, like, something like Freddie Hubbard or Woody Shaw. Um, and and the some of the, the other the other person who I was transcribing at a young age was um, Chet Baker. And, you know, the, the melodic sensibilities in both players is, like, you know, obviously super evident. Although I think Miles was able to really go and, you know, he's kind of like the... I mean, who who else is like Miles? You know, no one. No one's like Chet Baker either, but I feel like Miles has really just, you know, transformed so many different scenes. I mean, so many different time periods, and so many different, you know, periods of jazz and the bands that he's had. I mean, that's where I started. And then Don Cherry came in a little bit later, and then Booker Little, and then from there, kind of like everybody, you know. Kind of following your timeline, so to speak, you moved on to Chicago. Yeah, we moved to Chicagoland when I was nine years old, and that was also the year I started playing trumpet. If we had stayed in New York, I would have played the bass, the upright bass, but my um, elementary school in in, um, the suburbs of Chicago didn't have um, an orchestra, so my bass teams were smashed. You go to Chicago, then you go to the New England Conservatory. Yep. And then... Talk to me a little bit about kind of as you were growing up and going to New England Conservatory and in that educational realm, what advice did you give? What, what, what were some of the formal educational underpinnings that really stuck with you and made you, you know, that, that really stuck with you to this day? Well, Joe Maneri told me I should quit school and move back to Chicago. Hmm. <laughs> huh. And I think there's a lot of truth in that, you know, as far as like, wanting to be a, a professional musician and going to school seeming like a, you know, it's for me, I was introduced to many, many people there, uh, both friends and teachers who would become like major roles in my life. And that, but like, as far as like institutional type learning type things, you know, the thing I learned is that you have to be able to play your instrument and then you need to go out and play some gigs you know, yeah. um, it wasn't like, you know, I had, I would had, to, I was very, very blessed and, and I don't use that word a lot, but like I, I studied with Steve Lacey for a year before he passed and he really taught me some shit, but I feel like that is so separate from the institution, you know, yeah. um, he taught me about having the sound in your body and he taught me about the dance as a kid, I played in, like, punk and ska bands, and, like, those were, like, hyper-energetic, everybody freaking out side shows that, like, were super exciting, and then I, I loved to play jazz music, but the other, the flip side of that was, like, you know, you'd be playing in these, like, kind of sterile environments, you know, sit-down environments, which never really, like, meshed with me, and Steve was, like, the first one to teach me about the, like, internal dance in this, like, real way. And I think about that daily, and I still warm up the way he taught me. <laughs> right on. You, from there, you move on to Baltimore, and you get your master's degree. I did not get my master's, but I did go to Baltimore. Gotcha. Um, no, from NEC, I went to, back to Chicago. And I was in Chicago 10 years, Okay, basically. So, I guess my question is, kind of, you've had a good taste of different scenes. What, what were the scenes like, comparatively, in each of these areas, and how did it make you grow? For me, it taught me that you have to, like, find your people wherever you are. And coming from Chicago, like, I don't know if there could have been a better place to really start playing improvised music. Like, the the players that I was around um, who taught me, like, so much, you know. I was basically about 10 years younger than a lot of the people I was hanging with and playing with. And they really showed me the ropes, not just as far as, like, you know, how to play, but, like, how to act and, like, how to listen, you know? 
just like, you know, if I had gone to New York straight out of school, there's a lot of extra musical things in New York. In Chicago, that's not the case. It's about the music first. And if you're on some ego shit, you're not in it. You know, you're like, you're, you're out the pocket that night, you know? I think that in Baltimore, um, like Kansas City, there's a lot. There's a lot of arts there. There's a great art school. Um, there's a lot of musicians there. The cost of living it makes a lot more sense for what we do. <laughs> Baltimore. Um, my first experience was in 2007 at the High Zero Festival um, before I had moved there. And um, you know what struck me? If you don't know about that festival, it's it's um, they invite maybe like 15 people. Maybe more. There's like five sets a night going from a, a solo up to like a quintet. And it goes for three nights. And every single set is a band that has never played together before. So it's all improvisers. Yeah. Um, and they get put together on the spot. So that's like kind of a, an ethos in Baltimore, I think, of this like, we're going to go for this like as out as we can go type thing. And there's a lot of people there that build their own instruments. And I just thought that was so like... That was so awesome, too, you know? Yeah. For me, though, I, I, it took moving to New York. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a person. I'm a person that's, like, affected by their surroundings in a big way. So, like, if everybody's running around me and, like, you know, like in New York, it's super, like, chaotic and fast-paced. And so I, like, get super, you know, I, I, I quicken up. Um, in Baltimore, I felt like the pace was slower, and for me, I kind of was, like, able to, like, I don't know. It just wasn't working for me as a city, but the players there were excellent, you know. Absolutely. And that's the thing. There's, the, the other thing about living in a bunch of places is that you know that there's players everywhere. Like, you probably have never heard of the tenor saxophonist and bass clarinetist John Diker. Um, D-I-E-R-K-E-R, because nobody really has outside of Baltimore. He's one of the best bass clarinetist, tenor saxophonist that I've ever heard in my entire life, you know? So there's players, everybody. You just got to find your people. You know, that's the. I, I'm, I'm so glad you said that, because as somebody that programs and puts together... The, the, or being a music architect, so to speak, to put it out there. Those are the cats that I like the best. That's the reason why when I started doing this show back in 2011, I did not want to read about jazz. I don't want to read. I want you all to tell me the story. And this is the thing that's beautiful about this is that I'm going to find this cat and I'm going to put it on the show and I'm going to put it up next to your music because this is an influence. This is a part of your life. This is a part of the tapestry of jazz in this country and I hear about it all the time. I mean, I'll talk to cats in Boston, that the, these guys are strongholds, or in Chicago, and you know, there's all these people that are all over the country that are legendary there. That everybody's like, I can't believe the rest of the world doesn't know about it. And I guess that's one of the, hopefully, one of the positive outgrowths of radio, jazz radio, is that we can get these cats to be played. Yeah, I mean, people people got to hear them, and and not everybody wants a tour, you know, and not everybody's in a position to. If you have a family, you might have to, you might not be able to, you know. Uh, and I and I think it's super important to hear people, you know, like you can't be everywhere all at once. So I think it is really cool that we have jazz radio and stuff like that now and this internet, this internet thing the kids keep talking about, you know, yeah. so that <laughs> so that people can hear can hear these folks. So yeah, I just like kind of echo what you said. But yeah. yeah, it's it's good. It's good to disseminate it for sure. So you know, the one thing that that I always ask, and I like to ask musicians, like, how is jazz doing in 2019? But if this is a little bit different for you, because you're the embodiment, I think, of, you know, kind of other worlds of music where you're big. I mean, there's things that are happening. There's big tours. You're in, you're in Spain right now. Things are taking off. You run your own label. So my question to you is, is this. Not only is, what's your perception of how jazz is doing in 2019, but... How do you feel about all of these things that are happening to you in your professional life? I think that jazz is strong, and I use the term jazz very loosely. Like, I don't want to get, I don't want to get into semantics. I'm also a fan of, you know, the, the straight ahead or more straight ahead player uh, Nicholas Payton, who, who hates the word jazz and calls it bam, Black American music. You know, I don't, I don't want to get down in semantics. I, I think it's strong, and I think that right now. America and also the whole world is kind of primed for the more free expression, more experimental musics that are coming out. Um, 
because so much at this point has been heard that people's ears don't bristle as much um, to some of the things that we're doing. You know, it's not like I might be mixing a lot of things together, but I'm not really rewriting the book as far as I'm concerned. There's many, you know, there's so many things that have been done um, before. I'm just trying to like, um, like push it through the like <laughs> the baleen system, you know, of my mind or something. Like push it through the the, the sponge um, that is that is me, and that's and that's something that everybody can do. There's a lot of people right now, I think, that are pushing the envelope and and feeling a, a freedom that you know. The realities of being a jazz musician in America are that you're probably struggling, and so like. The upside to that is that you can be free and push as hard as you as you possibly can, you know? Because what do you have to lose? I think that free music and free jazz, you know, again, not to get bogged down in semantics, get, can can be a, a real fodder to all this, like, internet and, and all these, you know, all this, like, filtered life that, we, that we're also living in 2019. You know, kind of the opposite of music, in yeah. a way, you know? Yeah, I like that answer. What was one of the first live jazz shows you ever saw that really made you think, man, I love this? Ooh, that's a good question. A lot of the first jazz shows I saw were kind of like the, like, Ellington band or, like, the Daisy band, you know, coming to the to high school and playing, you know? Yeah. Of course, not with Ellington or Daisy, but, um, you know, playing. Man, that's a, that's a great question. I can say that, like seeing Matsuna Roberts for the first time, which had Taylor and Josh Abrams, really changed the way I was thinking about music. Listening to Ornette Coleman for the first time on record really changed the way I was thinking about music. I saw I saw um, Nicholas Payton play when I was quite young, and that really, I was like, oh my God, like I'm never going to be that good. And I, and I probably won't ever be that good, you know, as far as like what he does, because... No one can do Nicholas Payton better than Nicholas Payton, yeah. you know? But the upside of that is that no one can do Jamie Branch either, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. Um, so I just, I don't know. I'm a person that gets, like, really excited about music. <laughs> yeah. Like, if something is burning and I'm there, I'm, like, excited. I'm probably making noise. And, like, it just gets me on a uh, atomic level or something, you know? Um, I dig it. I saw Dave Holland at the Jazz Showcase when I was, like, 16. <laughs> I was at Quintet with, like, Point of Departure around that time. Um, I saw Dewey Redman at the Jazz Showcase also. Malachi Favors at um, the Velvet Lounge, Fred Anderson's Velvet Lounge, which is probably, that's, that's kind of the place that cemented that, like, this is the community I want to be a part of, I think. Yeah. Just like the whole atmosphere, the music that was being played. So let's carry this question a bit further, and I want to know, what do you like the best about being a, mu a, a professional musician? Um, <laughs> I like the whole lifestyle. I like it all. I like I like staying up late and getting up late, and I like <laughs> I like running around the world with my trumpet. And, you know, lately I've been really trying to pay attention to like the little joys in life and I think that being a musician allows you the freedom to like think about those things in a way where when you're working nine to five really kind of gets beaten out of you because you're you're up against the clock every day and I only quit my day job like a year and some change ago I, I don't know if it's this feeling of freedom because I'm able to be away from a day job right now or or what but I mean the music the music is tantamount, um, but everything else, uh, the, the relationships, the people, I mean, like, the, the musicians that I'm, I'm around and, and hang with and play with are, like, some of the finest people I've ever met, some of the smartest people I've ever met, you know? Yeah, I don't know if that's, if that's a cop-out to say I like it all, but, you know. No, 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 and I, and I always love it, too, whenever musicians talk about the community because I've always I originally started out in the media and I couldn't do it like I was just doing straight up just regular old media and I couldn't do it it was just the industry wasn't something that was cut out for me so later in life long story short I got back into it and 
pick jazz because I love it. But you, 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 this jazz community, all of you players are some of the finest people on the planet. I am always absolutely blown away by not only how talented, but how humble you are. And this is going from having a conversation some years ago with Sonny Rollins. That was the most humble human being I've ever spoken to in my life. And that's Sonny. You know what I'm saying? Hell I mean, yeah. You know, you, you, there's that's what a, I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, right. There's a torch that gets passed, and there's this vibe that goes into it. And anyway, I, I love that when musicians can pull that out because it's so epic about the community that you're in. That's some of the best people on the planet. I agree. And uh... my, my next question to you is this. Let's say you fall asleep tonight, you have a dream, and you run into your younger self. Let, let's say, you know, just like 10 years ago, and you can give yourself advice, one bit of advice. What are you going to tell your younger self? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. How old am I now? 36? So that's when I'm 26. At that time, 10 years ago, I was pretty, I was pretty like, caught up in a pretty bad drug habit so like i would say just fucking stop with that shit already it's gonna be played out um but the other thing i think is to just keep breathing you know and keep moving forward and it's something that i knew at that time but i think aging and getting older you become a little bit more secure in your bones you know yeah it's like, if I'm doing good shit, if I'm working on good shit, if I'm honest, if I'm, like, putting in the time, then what the fuck can blow me down? You know, like, sh there's a lot of things that can come my way, but what's actually going to fucking trample me, you know? Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of things, I think, you know, that we our brains get trained in this, like, flight or fight response type thing, and... And there's a lot of worry and a lot of, like, concern over things that aren't really life or death, you know? And so, so I would say to maybe, like, you know, just, like, lighten up a little bit. Yeah, I dig it. So everything's going to come down to this. Everyone has a perception of you, they, who they think you are. Your family, your friends, your fans. But you're living your life. Who do you think you are? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that I'm just part of the whole same web that everybody's part of. That's, that's really what I think. And, and just like music doesn't start or end, I, I, like the energy that we put out into the world isn't just in our bodies, you know? Uh, and I'm just one example of that. There's, you know, everybody is that. And we all have our own lights. And it's just like, how much can we let our light shine and, and how much are we going to extinguish our own shit? Totally. I dig that. That's great. Jamie, that's a great way to wrap everything up. Again, thank you right. for taking some time out. <laughs> Thank you for your music, and thank you for your story, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Kansas City Joe. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Baltimore, Chicago, Brooklyn, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Jamie for her time, cool, and stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com, and for everything Neon Jazz, all the time. Go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.